Welcome to the Science for the Public lecture series. Science for the Public is an organization committed to bringing science information and issues to the general public. Visit our website for our program listings and blog. Good evening, I'm Yvonne Stapp for Science for the Public and welcome to the lecture series tonight. Tonight our guest is Sharon Levy. Sharon Levy is a contributing editor at On Earth Magazine and she writes regularly for National Wildlife, Bioscience, Audubon, and New Scientist. Her work has also appeared in many other top science magazines such as Natural History, Nature, Wildlife Conservation, High Country News, and Discovery Channel Online. For almost two decades, Ms. Levy has covered an impressive range of environmental uh, concerns. The role, for example, of top predators in maintaining ecosystems, um, things like sewage recycling, and even bioengineered mosquitoes. She excels at raising public awareness and the importance of wildlife not as a decorative object for civilization, but as a necessity for the survival of the planet. Levy describes particularly well the ways in which even subtle changes in an ecosystem can have widespread effects, both on the local level and on life well beyond the local uh, or fixed geographic area. Tonight, Sharon Levy discusses the relationship between large animal uh, extinctions in the Ice Age and the epidemic of species extinctions we are witnessing today. In her new book, Once and Future Giants, What Ice Age Extinctions Tell Us About the Fate of Earth's Largest Animals, she investigates the impact of humans on large beasts and their ecological systems in two very different epochs. The book makes for fascinating reading as Levy carefully evaluates competing theories regarding the human role in extinctions in prehistoric and contemporary eras. It is a major contribution to an understanding of why we must protect wildlife. It's a special pleasure to welcome Sharon Levy. Thank you all so much for coming out tonight. I want to start by telling you a story. And there we go. The story is about a young mother. She lived and died in central Michigan 13,000 years ago. I call her Owasso, which is the name of the town in Michigan where her bones were discovered. And this young mother had a really hard life. She gave birth for the first time when she was 10 years old. And over the next few years, she gave birth three more times. And while her first baby had survived, the next three infants all died before they reached one year of age. And Owasso herself died in her 20s. And after she was dead, members of an enemy tribe came along, found her body, and ate parts of it. While I have you Pondering this grim scenario, I need to tell you something else about Owasso. She wasn't a woman. She was a mastodon. And she was one of the very last mastodons to walk the earth. The enemies who came along and ate meat from her body were some of America's earliest human settlers. And Owasso's story can teach us some important lessons that can help us protect living elephants. It turns out that the last of the mastodons form a kind of mirror image of endangered elephants in Africa and Asia today. And by looking back at those Stone Age people who ate the meat from Owasso's body, we can learn a lot about the way our own species has reshaped the world and why today we still need big wild animals. So, Today I want to share some stories with you 
They're stories I came across while I was researching my book, Once in Future Giants. And they're stories about people and animals. Some of them are very ancient, and some of them are very contemporary. They're happening today. But they are the stories that stuck in my mind, and I hope to use them to convince you that 13,000 years after she died, Owasso's story still matters. Now, first of all, I want to give you a glimpse of the world Owasso lived in. She lived in an America that was thronged with giant wild animals. It was such an intense environment that it would have made the modern Serengeti plain in Africa look pretty tame. There weren't just mastodons like Owasso. America had seven different species of elephant. This was the tallest of them all, the Colombian mammoth. The average mammoth stood about 14 feet at the shoulder. There were also woolly mammoths, and there was a thing called the gonfathir, which was a cousin of the mastodon that lived in South and Central America. And there were many other giant herbivores. America is where camels and horses first evolved. So there were great herds of both of those kinds of animals roaming around. <coughs> and there were other giant vegetarians that are very hard to imagine because there's almost nothing like them in the modern world. This is a ground sloth. Its closest living relative are the tree sloths that live in Central and South America. But these were gigantic beasts. They were built like tanks. And even though they were vegetarians, I imagine they would have been very frightening to encounter. When the tallest of them reared up on its hind legs, they would have stood as tall as a mammoth. And of course, there was an array of impressive predators who were taking advantage of all these large vegetarian animals. And this is my personal favorite, the saber-toothed cat. These large stabbing canines were so incredibly long that the animal's jaw had to be constructed to drop open like a trap door to make room for its own teeth. And in the course of my research, I came across one fellow who has a 25,000-year-old saber-toothed saber cat canine. It's still razor sharp, and he uses it to open his letters. Um, and they're just fascinating beasts. We know that they were social animals. And that conclusion comes out of evidence from the La Brea tar pits in Los Angeles, where many saber-tooths and, and many other Ice Age animals have been found. And quite a few of the saber tooths had suffered serious broken bones and lived on for significant periods of time after. That would only be possible if their families fed them while they recovered. We also had dire wolves in America and lions, the same species that lives in Africa today. But the ones in Pleistocene America were 25% bigger. But all these fantastic animals disappeared in a small window of time, 13,000 years ago, at the close of the last ice age. What happened to them? Well, for a long time, most scientists assumed that all these giant animals, which are known collectively as the megafauna, had all gone extinct because of rapid climate change. And the basic argument goes like this. It was the end of the ice age, Glaciers were receding, temperatures were rising quickly, and as that happened, vegetation patterns were likely to change quickly too. It might have become much more difficult for large animals like these woolly mammoths or mastodons like Owasso who lived in Michigan to find enough food to eat. And if the large vegetarians began to dwindle away, then the big predators that relied on them would fade out also. But there's a problem with that scenario. And the problem is that the Ice Age was really a series of Ice Ages. It's known as the Pleistocene epoch, and it was more than two million years long. By the way, Pleistocene is just the scientific word for this era. And I'll say Ice Age and Pleistocene interchangeably. But over the course of those Ice Ages, the course of the 
two plus million years of the Pleistocene, the climate cycled over and over again. During extremes of cold, there were glaciers as far south as modern day Oregon and modern day Italy, places that are temperate today. But then during warmer spells, the climate was temperate and much like our own climate. So all these big animals had survived repeated warm spells before. There's nothing in the geological or paleontological record to suggest that this last warming spell 13,000 years ago was really different in any significant way from the previous ones. But something was different because all these big animals disappeared forever. Owasso's story offers some intriguing clues as to what happened at the end of the Ice Age. What was that critical difference? And we know Owasso's story in amazing detail because of this guy, Dan Fisher. He's a paleontologist who works at the University of Michigan. And over the past 30 years, he has taught himself to read detailed life histories out of the tusks of mammoths and mastodons. Now an elephant tusk is the elephant's version of an incisor tooth, just like the incisors we all have. But in elephants, the tusk grows throughout the animal's life. And if you slice through a tusk the way you might slice through a banana, you'll get a disc of ivory lined with concentric rings. They're growth rings, a lot like the rings you'd see if you slice through a tree trunk. And by reading subtle variations in these growth lines, Fisher can tell a lot of things about what happened during a mammoth or mastodon's life. And in Owasso's case, he could tell that three times she got pregnant. That pattern shows up in the growth rings because when an animal is pregnant, she channels all her energy to her infant and the growth rings in her tusk get smaller. Well, she got pregnant three times, and three times her baby vanished before it could possibly have reached the age of weaning. Fisher uses data from modern elephants to help him interpret what he finds in mammoth and mastodon fossils. And one interesting fact is that Owasso lost more of her young than most modern African elephant mothers do, even those who are living in parts of Africa where poaching remains a serious problem. But there's a broader pattern that I think is even more important. And Fisher found this pattern by looking at a whole array of mastodon tusks from the final 2,000 years that the species existed. And over the course of those 2,000 years, the age of puberty in mastodons dropped. So at the start of that time, the mastodons were becoming sexually mature at the age of 13. And at the end of that time, they were becoming mature at the age of 10. And that's a telling pattern. Because research on all kinds of animals, from fish to elephants, has shown that when animals are experiencing intense hunting pressure, they will start to mature at a younger age. It gives them more of a chance at reproducing before they're hunted and killed off themselves. And by contrast, modern elephants in Africa who are going through times of hunger and drought tend to delay their age of sexual maturity. They're waiting out the bad times, waiting for a time when it might be more successful to mate and to try to raise a baby. Now, we know for sure that Owasso lived at a time of dramatic change in North America. Temperatures were rising quickly, the glaciers were receding, and the environment was drying out. And while all these changes were happening, a culture of skilled Stone Age hunters fanned out across all of North America. This culture is known as the Clovis culture, and the people made these beautiful stone spear points that are shaped like leaves. And they left these classic spear points that archaeologists find very easy to identify, 
They left these spear points behind among the bones of mammoths and mastodons that they hunted and killed. And the kills are scattered from Arizona all the way to Maine. And they all happened in a small window of time, 13,000 years ago. And it's clear that the native elephants of America were a big item in Clovis life. If you look at this picture, the tool with the loop on the end is a wrench made from mammoth bone. So they not only ate mammoth meat, but they made stuff. They made tools out of mammoths. In every known elephant kill in America, every mammoth or mastodon kill has been found right at a water source. And that's very suggestive. It suggests that during this hot, dry time, the elephants were trapped in little oases where they could be within a day's walk of water. And that would have made them even easier for people to find and to hunt down. It's impossible to know exactly what happened at the end of Owasso's life. She may have been killed by Clovis people, or she may have died of other causes, and people then came along and scavenged meat from her body. But we know for sure that someone butchered her feet because there are clear knife marks on her foot bones. And that makes a lot of sense because elephant feet contain big pads of fat that cushion the toe bones from the strain of the tremendous weight they have to carry. And if you were an Ice Age person in Michigan, you definitely would have been craving fat. But whatever happened in Owasso's individual case, there's growing evidence that what did in the megafauna as a big group was a kind of one-two punch. They were on the ropes from the effects of climate change. They were under a lot of stress from trying to adapt to that. And then at the same moment in time, hunting pressure was really intensified when people showed up. And there's an important lesson, a take-home lesson, for modern conservation. In previous warm spells, previous times of climate shift during the Pleistocene, all these big animals had been able to roam as far as they wanted to until they could find good habitat. And that is how they survived all those previous warm spells. Today, modern elephants and other surviving megafauna are trapped in little islands of habitat that are surrounded by us in our cities and our roads and our ranches. So studying the mammoth and mastodon extinctions has helped fuel a drive to create international habitat corridors, international wildlife parks in both Africa and in the Americas. This is a photo of Kruger National Park in South Africa, which is part of one of these transboundary parks. And the idea is simple, but it's very important. Big animals like elephants need room to roam, and they need it especially urgently at this moment in time when our climate is changing so rapidly. So that's one very reasonable conservation approach that's come out of studies of the Pleistocene megafauna, among other kinds of research. But there's also a much more radical conservation proposal that's really based in the work of a man who had a mad passion for the lost Pleistocene giants. So I'd like to tell you a bit about him now. This is Paul Martin. He was a totally charming guy, and I'm very lucky I got to meet him. He passed away a few months ago. When he was a young guy, just starting out his career, he came up with an outrageous new theory. At the time, all of his mentors, pretty much everyone in the field, accepted the conventional wisdom that the Pleistocene megafauna were killed off by climate change. And Martin said he did, didn't think so. He proposed a radically different scenario. He said, Clovis people did it. Clovis people were guilty of what he himself described as a hunting blitzkrieg. And he suggested 
that when the Clovis people came over the Bering Land Bridge, they stumbled into a whole continent full of naive animals who had never seen a human being before and wouldn't know how to react to a human hunter. And in Martin's vision, the Clovis people proceeded to just slaughter their way across the continent. At one point, he proposed that the Blitzkrieg killed the, all the megafauna off so quickly that it happened in a matter of decades. There's not a lot of fossil evidence for his theory, but Martin even claimed that the lack of evidence showed how quickly the Blitzkrieg had happened. When Martin first came up with this idea, it mostly earned him a lot of ribbing from his colleagues who thought it was just absurd. Martin didn't care though. He said, I like a theory that goes way out on a branch and sees how long it can hang there. Well, decades later, some points of his hypothesis have been shown to be wrong, or at least extremely unlikely. But the core of his argument, the idea that humans played a meaningful role in those mass extinctions at the end of the Pleistocene, that idea has not fallen off the branch. That idea has come to shape the way many scientists think about this whole issue. So I want to tell you a little bit about who Martin was as a person, because I think that had everything to do with what he accomplished as a scientist. Martin grew up in a little farming town in Pennsylvania. His dad was a vet. And he spent all his free time as a kid wandering around the fields with some binoculars and a first edition copy of the Roger Torrey Peterson Field Guide to Birds. He was a devoted bird nerd. When he was 13, he told his parents he was done going to church because he decided that a Sunday spent outdoors was far more illuminating. And two years later, he quit his high school marching band in the middle of a performance. An osprey like this one flew by. And so he dropped his cymbals on the ground in the middle of a song and went off to follow the osprey. So by the time Martin arrived at Cornell University at age 18 as a freshman, he was already a pretty skillful naturalist. It took him only a year or two to snag the job of his dreams. He was hired by one of his professors at Cornell to travel to Tamaulipas, Mexico, and to hike through the cloud forests collecting bird specimens. I wish I'd been able to blow this photo up a bit better, but Martin is the third guy from the left, the tall one behind the little boy. And if I was able to blow his face up for you better, you would see an expression of absolute bliss. He was in heaven. Every day he would hike long hours in the mountains, carrying a big pack full of heavy collecting gear. And he would find and shoot and stuff all kinds of birds, hummingbirds, hawks, eagles, parrots. For him, this was perfection. But then in the summer of 1950, it was time for him to go back to Cornell and deliver a batch of bird specimens. And while he was at Cornell, Martin fell very ill. First he had a searing headache, and then a high fever. And then he couldn't move. He was flown on an emergency flight to New York City. And for two months, he was in the hospital fighting the polio virus. It was 1950, in the days before the vaccine. And Martin made it through, obviously. But by the time he recovered, he had suffered permanent damage to the nerves controlling both of his legs. He could walk, but doing so was a real struggle, and he needed a cane. And this meant that the world of field biology, this world that he had such a passion for, was close to him. I didn't meet Paul until 50 years later. But I asked him, how did that blow feel? And he said, I'm 80. I don't remember what things felt like 50 years ago. Not even lovemaking. But I do remember this. The seductions of field work are so extraordinary that if I'd still been able to do that, I never would have learned so much about the Ice Age megafauna 
And so, he said, his handicap opened a door to the exploration of near time. Near time is a phrase used by many scientists who study life over the past 50,000 years. But in Martin's case, it had a double meaning. It described the era that was most alive in his bumptious imagination. He arrived in the 1960s at the University of Arizona as a newly minted professor, and it was the perfect moment. Because some of his colleagues in Arizona had just recently discovered a cave deep in a remote slot of the Grand Canyon. They named it Rampart Cave. And it turned out to be full of bones and manure of extinct giant ground sloths. And for Martin, who had spent years learning to analyze fossil pollen and other fossilized plant parts, it was the poop that was an absolute treasure. So by analyzing ancient plant parts in different layers of this dung deposit at Rampart Cave, he was able to show that ground sloths were very versatile eaters. And they did very well eating plants that grew during colder times, but they could also do just fine on the kinds of desert shrubs that came to dominate the region 13,000 years ago, the end of the Ice Age, when the ground sloths disappeared. That certainly didn't support the idea that climate change alone drove the extinctions. And Martin saw it as a confirmation of his Blitzkrieg idea. And he began to do everything he could to put himself back into that lost world of the American giants. He found lots of evidence of a plant called globe mallow in the dung at Rampart Cave. And so he wandered out into the desert outside his own lab and munched up some globe mallow leaves himself. They were pretty bland, he said, but you probably wouldn't care if you were a ground sloth. And despite the logistical difficulties imposed by his handicap, Martin found a way to get himself to Rampart Cave. And when he first entered the cave, he was delighted to find that the manure was so well preserved that the place still smelled of poo, as if a living sloth had just wandered out. And he hunkered down by the cave entrance and imagined himself as one of these great sloths, looking out through that gap in the rock, watching the arrival of a strange two-legged beast that was going to mean the end of everything. But Martin didn't stop with figuring out the past. He also began to dream about recreating as much as possible the megafauna of, of the American Ice Age. And as early as the 60s, he was publishing papers in which he suggested that we should bring endangered camels from Asia and endangered eland from Africa to the desert southwest in America, where he argued they could forage efficiently alongside domestic cows and make the ecosystem healthier in the process. Well, once again, nobody much took Martin seriously. This was a guy famous for wacky ideas. And at a time when ecologists were very busy documenting the impacts of invasive species, this idea sounded particularly wacky. But over the decades, Martin built a real following of devoted scientists. And in 2005, he was one of a dozen prestigious scientists who co-authored a paper that appeared in Nature. And in it, they made their pitch for what they called Pleistocene rewilding. And their basic idea was they wanted to bring old world megafauna like African lions and elephants to enclosed reserves on the Great Plains and see if these animals could act as ecological stand-ins for their lost Ice Age relatives. Now, unsurprisingly, this proposal provoked a lot of controversy and the authors knew very well that it would they ran this graph with their Nature article. You gotta have a graph when you're published in Nature. It's expected. But I love this graph because it's so unscientific. One axis shows the ecological value that they hoped these different animals would have when they were introduced. And the other axis shows the amount of fuss they expected each species to provoke. And you'll notice that lions and elephants ranked high in both respects. <laughs> 
Martin died at his home in Tucson last September. He was 82, and he did not believe in an afterlife. He told me he was a non-theist, as if the word atheist didn't put it across well enough. And he also said that the living world was more than enough for him to believe in. And I'm sure that in his mind, the mastodon and the sloth were very much alive. I think Paul Martin's ideas were always provocative and always, thought, always got people to move past their entrenched ways of thinking, or at least nudge them in that direction. But a lot of his ideas sound very impractical. And I have to say, when I first heard, the price to, heard about the Pleistocene rewilding proposal, I thought it sounded completely nuts. It was certainly contrary to much of what I had been taught as a student of ecology. Introduced species are bad news. Ecologists spend much of their time and effort trying to get rid of introduced species, trying to return habitats to what we see as their native condition. On the other hand, I think the strength of the Pleistocene rewilding argument is that it forces us to look at some long-held assumptions. What does native mean? What does pristine mean? In a world where everything from the air animals breathe to the balance between the predators and the prey has been changed by human actions. So I thought about the fact that most US conservationists have this goal in their minds that they should try to return wilderness to the condition it was in, say, in 1491, the moment before Europeans invaded the hemisphere. And I thought about the fact that that ignored not only thousands of years of impact by Native American people, but the loss of this whole array of Ice Age giants, a loss that maybe was triggered by people. And I decided to look at some real life cases of rewilding to see how they had turned out. Now, the first and most obvious example that came to mind was the horse. Horses evolved here in America. And at some point, millions of years ago, on their own, they wandered across the Bering Land Bridge into Asia. And there they proceeded to evolve into every old world form of horse, including all the different zebras of Africa, the Przewalski's horse of Asia, that's the brown guy, and there was also a European wild horse, the tarpon, which is now extinct. But all the horses in America disappeared 13,000 years ago. So when the conquistadors showed up in the 1500s, bringing their domesticated horses with them, they were committing an act of Pleistocene rewilding. Well, how did this turn out? Today, we have mustangs, wild horses, roaming across much of the Great Basin, which is a vast stretch of rugged, arid land between the Sierra Range in California and the Wasatch Range in Utah. And in one way, these horses are an incredible rewilding success story. The ones that are still alive in the wild are very smart, very hardy, and their populations just boom. They do just fine on their continent of origin, but for that very reason, they're an ecological disaster. The problem with the Mustang in the modern Americas is that it's lost its predators. Obviously, the big predators that were capable of tackling an animal like a horse, the American lion, the saber-toothed cat, those animals are long gone. And under modern law, we're not allowed to hunt mustangs the way we do elk or deer. And they're not routinely slaughtered and managed the way domestic cattle are. And so horse populations just keep booming. The average wild horse population increases by 20% every year. And that's just unsustainable. When that starts to happen, the horses devour all the available forage 
which has negative impacts on native animals and also on the horses themselves. In times of overcrowding, they slowly starve to death. And so every year, the BLM does what you see in this photograph. They round up excess Mustangs and try to adopt them out to people. But there are just too many animals, and they can never adopt them all out. And many of these animals end up living for years in small enclosures run by the Bureau of Land Management, which seems like a pretty miserable fate for a wild creature. And in ecological terms, it just doesn't wash. It's unsustainable. So it would seem that the take-home lesson from the Mustang is that place to scene rewilding won't work in the real modern world. And even some of the most avid proponents of rewilding have done in-depth studies of Mustang ecology and acknowledge the major problems. But they still dream about rewilding. And I couldn't base my conclusion on one example. So of course, on the other side of the world, I found the opposite story. I found an introduced creature that is actively rescuing endangered native plants and animals. This unlikely hero is the dingo in Australia. The dingo is not native technically to Australia. It was introduced by sailors who came from Southeast Asia and reached the Australian continent about 4,000 years ago. And when the dingoes came ashore, they were quickly adopted as pets by Aboriginal people, but many of them also went into the wild and did very well for themselves. But when Europeans reached Australia, the dingo was treated as vermin and intensely persecuted. And this began in the 1830s when the first ranchers moved into the arid interior of Australia. And the dingoes were quick to figure out that sheep and calves made easy prey. And the settlers were quick to decide that the only good dingo would be a dead one. Australians are very serious about this issue. They even built the world's longest fence. This is one end of it. It's more than 3,000 miles long. It crosses the entire continent in an effort to keep dingoes out of sheep country in South Australia. Now, to put the story of the dingo into context, you need to know that Australia had experienced its own mass extinction of large animals during the Pleistocene. In Australia, this event happened 50,000 years ago, excuse me, 45,000 years ago, a few thousand years after the first people settled in Australia, which was roughly 50,000 years ago. So there's a matchup as in America between the arrival of people and a mass disappearance of large animals. But Ice Age Australia had an amazing array of critters. There was a marsupial lion, that's the scary looking skeleton. It had an opposable thumb with a huge claw on it that was kind of like a switchblade. The other creature in the slide was in the wombat family. It was a creature called Diprotodon. It stood as tall as a rhino and it had giant buck teeth like a beaver and it was spread all over Australia. There were also giant lizards and snakes. There was a kangaroo that stood 10 feet tall and had long arms like a human being. But all these amazing creatures disappeared. That is with one interesting exception, the thylacine. The thylacine was Australia's last large native predator. But it went extinct on mainland Australia right around the time that dingoes spread through the continent and became a common animal. Many researchers have assumed that dingoes outcompeted thylacines and drove them to the edge and over it, drove them into extinction. And that proposition is debatable, but there's a piece of circumstantial evidence that seems pretty damning. And that piece of evidence is that thylacines survived into historic time on the island of Tasmania off the Australian coast. And dingoes never got to Tasmania. But Europeans, of course, did. And soon after, Europeans settled Tasmania and began ranching there 
they put a bounty on the heads of thylacines because they feared that thylacines were hunting their sheep. Well, that's a picture of a bounty hunter with a dead thylacine in the early 1900s. The last animal died in about 1930. So in modern Australia, the reality is the only large predator aside from human beings is the dingo. The other important reality is that Europeans didn't stop introducing species when they brought their sheep and their cattle. They introduced a bunch of other European critters and all of them have become major problems. There's the rabbit. Many of you probably have heard about the rabbit proof fence. Rabbits, of course, multiply like rabbits, and there's nothing much to prey on them in Australia, aside from the occasional dingo, so their populations just went crazy. And they compete with small native marsupials for forage. And the other two serious culprits are the house cat, which has gone feral in the outback and has a huge wild population, and the European fox, which is doing very well in the outback, too. And both of these creatures, um, tend to hunt surviving native marsupials. And there's a whole body of emerging research in Australia that shows that where there are healthy dingo populations, that native populations of plants and marsupials, even reptiles, are all more abundant and diverse. And on the other hand, in places where people have succeeded in their mission to wipe out dingoes, many native marsupials have gone extinct. There are, there are examples like this cute little critter, the yellow-footed rock wallaby. This animal only exists in a few spots where they are protected by dingoes. And where dingoes have been wiped out, this animal is completely gone. So the dingo in modern Australia exists in a strange kind of legal limbo. In the Northern Territory, in the state of Victoria, it's a protected species. And in the rest of the country, people are legally required to try to kill off dingoes on their ranch lands. And every year the government spends lots of money dropping poison baits from helicopters to kill dingoes. And yet there's this contingent of ecologists who are saying the easiest, most economical way to protect our remaining native wildlife is to just let dingoes alone. Well, this argument is still raging in Australia. It's far from settled. And for people to accept the dingo as an essential top predator in modern Australia takes a kind of leap of faith or a leap of thinking that many people have not been willing or able to make yet. But if people could change their minds, I think this animal would be a very successful, if unplanned, example of Pleistocene rewilding. Probably everyone knows this quote from Aldo Leopold. To keep every cog and wheel is the first precaution of intelligent tinkering. Well, it's very well put and it makes a lot of sense, but the truth is there are many places in the world where it's too late. We've already killed off important cogs and wheels. That's true, obviously, in Australia which is the world capital of mammal extinctions, unfortunately. And it's also true on the island of Mauritius in the Indian Ocean. As far as we know, humans had never been on Mauritius until it was discovered by Dutch sailors in the 1600s. And once the Dutch settled the island, they were very quick to drive all the large fruit-eating animals endemic to Mauritius into extinction. The most famous one was the flightless dodo, a 40-pound relative of the pigeon. But there were also two species of giant tortoise and a giant lizard, a skink, that grew up to three feet long. <clears throat> all these animals ate large fruits, and they're all gone forever. Now, in modern-day Mauritius, even in reserves where people are very laboriously and carefully weeding out invasive plants to give native plants a chance to thrive. There are many plants that produce large fruits that seem perfectly designed to lure a tortoise, and these kinds of plants are dwindling away, even in the reserves where people are doing all they can 
to give them a chance. And this is one example. It's a plant called Syzygium mammillatum. And every year, it produces bright pink blossoms low on its trunk, right about the height that a tortoise could reach. And after the blossoms come these large fruits. And a researcher named Dennis Hansen went into a reserve on Mauritius and studied this. And he found that there are no new seedlings of this plant coming up more than one meter away from a parent tree. And it's a well-known principle in tropical ecology that in order to survive, trees have to be spread far from their parent. If they're right under the parent tree, they're either going to be shaded to death by their parent, or they're going to be devoured by seed predators, beetles and rodents that are attracted to this place where all this fruit has been dropped. And these kinds of plants co-evolved with large frugivores, large fruit-eating animals. In fact, they're not the specific plant, but there are other large fruiting plants around the world whose seeds won't even germinate until they've passed through an animal's gut. One example is the honey locust, which is fairly common in much of the US, including around here. And if you want to get a honey locust seed to germinate without passing it through a cow, you have to either soak it in sulfuric acid or break it open with a metal file. So there's lots of evidence that these kinds of plants co-evolved with fruit eaters and need them. So Hansen tried an experiment. He brought in some Aldabra tortoises, which are a large tortoise from a different island chain. And he had them in captivity, and he brought them fruits of this endangered plant. And then he carefully tracked the tortoise poop and picked out the seeds. And he did a controlled experiment where, where he compared the growth of seeds that had been through a tortoise to the growth of seeds that had just been taken out of the fruit by hand. And he showed that tortoise past seeds produce taller, leafier, more robust seedlings than those that have not been through the tortoise. And Hansen would like to see tortoises released in Black River Gorges National Park, which is the largest reserve on Mauritius. It's a politically touchy idea, and it's controversial. But in Hansen's eyes, these tortoises are a critical replacement part. And there's good evidence that it can work, because on a small uninhabited islet off the coast of Mauritius, a conservation group introduced Aldabra tortoises back in 2000. And at the time the tortoises were introduced, there were many endangered plants, including an ebony tree that had been reduced to one tiny patch and was near the end. But since the tortoises have been there, there are new ebony seedlings popping up all over the island, growing out of heaps of tortoise poop. So, Hansen would say that it's better if you need a large fruit eater or a large predator. It's better to bring one in from somewhere else than to struggle along with nothing at all. To close this, I'd like to go back to Owasso, the sad mastodon. This is her skeleton. It's mounted in the museum at the University of Michigan. And when I stood in front of her, I was overwhelmed with sympathy. As I knew about her experiences in such amazing detail from talking to Dan Fisher. And you could see just from looking at her bones, she'd broken a tusk off in some battle during her life. She'd been through a lot. And even though she'd been gone for an incomprehensible length of time, I felt some kind of connection to her. I think what drew me to this topic in the first place was just that mastodons and other great creatures of the Ice Age were, to use a technical term, really awesome. But as I researched the book, I came to see that understanding them is not just about romance or sentiment. It's about our own survival. Back 13,000 years ago, when so many diverse kinds of giants disappeared, the global weight, the global biomass of megafauna plummeted 
Most scientists define megafauna as any kind of animal that weighs at least 100 pounds at adulthood, so that includes us. And the planet can sustain only so many of us. After the mass extinction 13,000 years ago, pretty soon after that, people invented agriculture. And that allowed our populations to multiply and expand. And within a few thousand years, the, the mass, the weight of people and their domestic livestock had replaced all the missing biomass of the extinct giants. And the human population held at that point for a while until, and I blink ago in geologic terms, we invented mining fossil fuels, mining energy out of the deep past. And that invention has allowed our populations to multiply beyond any biological bound. And so today, human beings weigh far more than all the megafauna of the planet did at their most abundant moment of the Ice Age. And if the system should crash, as it did 13,000 years ago, the toll would be taken on human beings. I think we need to understand the megafauna because at this moment in time, the megafauna is us. Thank you.